Okay. Yes, I give the word to you for uh, his uh, talk today. Uh, and uh, would you allow, uh, I, I beg your pardon, but I forgot the title of your talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's on the screen. So, Six Masters Conjecture in the Interior of Pascal's Triangle. Please. Okay, well, it's a very great honor to be uh, speaking here and to be inducted into this academy. I, I had not realized that I was taking the position that uh, Louis Nuremberg uh, had. You know, I, I did meet uh, Louis a couple of times, and I was al um, he's always been a big hero of mine, and he's also such a gentle, nice person as well. So it's very touching to, uh, to be, have this connection with him. Um, so I'm going to speak about um, a problem in number theory, which is one of the purest areas of mathematics. Um, I don't need this. Okay. Um, and um, in number theory, uh, the thing about number theory is that it's very easy to make questions that are easy to state, but very difficult to prove. Um, and it's, uh, it keeps us humble somehow, though. The whole, the, it keeps the, the entire subfield humble. There are all these questions we can't answer. Um, and uh, so one of these questions is Singmaster's conjecture about a very uh, basic object in uh, number theory or in mathematics as a whole, which is Pascal's triangle, which uh, I, th I guess you have all seen in high school. Um, yeah, it's, it, these are the binomial coefficients uh, of which you, you, uh, uh, you take the numbers one on, on the diagonals and every number is a sum of the two numbers above it. And this is the, the famous Pascal's triangle. Um, and if you look at this triangle, um, and you start looking for repetitions, numbers that appear twice uh, or three times, uh, you see, uh, of course, there's a one appears a lot. Okay, so number one appears all, all over the place. And there's a symmetry um, that, 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 that every number on the left has a, is reflected on the right. Um, but there's, there's, a few, there's a few other repetitions too, like for example, six appears up here and it also appears over there. Um, and um, so in the, in the 70s, uh, David Singmaster um, studied the question of how often, um, um, how many repetitions there are. Um, and uh, what he concluded, or what he guessed, or conjectured, is that uh, apart from the number one, which appears uh, infinitely often, um, all the other numbers, um, natural numbers, only appear a bounded number of times in Pascal's triangle. So there is some upper bound, maybe 10 or 20 or something, and, and every single number, um, if you take any number t, the number of times uh, t, uh, t appears in the triangle is bounded by this um, um, by a universal bound. So, um, so th there is no number that appears, say, one million times uh, in the triangle, um, uh, other than the number one, which appears every, uh, which appears infinitely often. So, uh, so th this is the conjecture. Um, it's a fairly simple conjecture to state. Um, in fact, uh, the belief is actually uh, no number appears more than eight times. Uh, and there's, there's a, um, in this triangle other than one, but we, well, we can't prove that either. Um, so uh, there's some simple remarks about this, about this um, conjecture. So um, there is a symmetry, of course, the left half of the triangle and the right half are symmetric. So you only need to actually look at the left half of the triangle um, because if there's a bound on the left half, you just double it. You get the bound on the, on the whole triangle. Um, and the first row, the, f the first diagonal is just all ones, and that's not very interesting. Um, and this, the second uh, uh, diagonal, that's just all the numbers, one, two, three, four, five. So every number appears once in here. So um, we can just remove these two, these two um, diagonals. That's, that's not very important either. And we can just look at uh, this sort of lower half of the triangle and just count repetitions there. So if you do that, um, so if you strip out, uh, if you look at the left half of the triangle and you remove the first two rows, uh, you get a, a sort of a smaller triangle of numbers. Uh, so, for example, on the fourth row, now the only number left is two. Uh, four choose two, which is six. Um, and so uh, now there are, you've, you've taken away all the easy sort of um, repetitions, and there's not very many repetitions left. Um, so there's still, a, there's still a few collisions. For example, uh, 10 choose three is 120, uh, and 16 choose two is also 120. So there is a, a collision here. Uh, and the number 3003 also appears twice in here. But most of these numbers are now different. Um, so there are now very few collisions. Um, now, um, but there's still, uh, there's still some. Um, so um, a couple of mathematicians, Lin, Singmaster, and Tovey, 
Um, they observed, yeah, so, so one thing you see about this collision is that th these two, um, this repetition appear, th these two repetitions appear very close to each other on the table. Um, uh, the n here is just one larger than the n, the n here, and the m here is one larger than, than the, m, the, the m here. So um, Singh Master and Toby and Lin studied collisions of um, binomial coefficients that were very close to each other. Uh, and for this particular collision, you can cancel a lot of terms, and um, uh, the equation actually simplifies to an equation that we do know how to solve. It's called Pell's equation. Um, and uh, this equation actually has an infinite number of solutions. Um, there's actually, um, um, you can solve for this equation using the Fibonacci numbers, of all things. Um, and every Fibonacci number actually gives you a, a solution to, the, to, this, uh, um, to this equation. Um, so we already saw that 3003 was, uh, you could write in two different ways. So there's one collision there. Uh, and then there's, a, there's a, couple, uh, um, a couple more collisions of this type. So there's actually an infinite family of, of collisions like this, um, the Lin-Singh-Master-Toby Lin collisions. So uh, these are some of the collisions that we know about. Um, and then there's a few others. So we already saw over here that there, were, there was this other collision uh, which isn't of the, f uh, of the form of two adjacent um, coefficients. And so uh, there's a few of those as well. Um, so if you just do a comp get a computer to search for a few collisions, you find seven um, other binomial coefficients that agree. So 16 choose 2 and 10 choose 3, 120. And there's a, there's a couple more like this. Um, it turns out that th the number 3003, which was already um, um, one of the, uh, the other collisions that we found, it, it, it also this number appears one more time. Uh, it's also 78 choose 2. So there are these seven uh, what we call sporadic collisions. Um, but then uh, if, you, if you run the computer a bit more, it, it stops. You, you don't find any more. Um, and so what seems, what seems to be true is that the co these collisions that I told you about are all the collisions that are in the triangle. There's, there's no, there, are no, there appear to be no further collisions. Um, so in fact, uh, this was explicitly conjectured by De Vega in the 90s that, um, that, the, the, um, that in the left half of the triangle, once you get rid of the first two rows, um, the only collisions that are remaining are the ones that we have just described. Um, and then uh, if you unfold all that, um, if, you, if you ask what does this mean for the entire triangle, this means that in Pascal's triangle, um, every number will actually only appear at most six times uh, once you unfold the triangle. And there's one special number, 3003, um, which happens to appear eight times um, in the triangle. Um, but that appears to be the only number that does that, and every other number appears at most six times. Um, okay, so, we, so in particular, Singh Master's conjecture would be true, and the bound should be eight. Um, so this is the belief, um, but we don't know how to prove this. Um, we have lots and lots of partial results. Um, so of course, you can get a computer to start checking the first few values. Um, so for example, we know that for the first one million rows of this triangle, this conjecture is true. Um, so the, the, there are no other collisions up to the first one million rows. Or if you look at all entries of size up to 10 to the 60, um, so uh, the, um, you can count how many times any, every given number appears. And, and uh, up to a very large range, no number appears more than eight times. Um, there are, um, uh, th so there's just two coordinates. There's n, which is the, the row, and m, which is the, um, uh, the, the column. Um, if the, if the uh, columns are, are small, um, we also know um, that, there are no, uh, that there's no other collisions. Like if, if you compare the second column with the third column, there was no other collisions than the ones we just listed. And there's a few other values that, uh, 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 that we can solve. Um, these use the theory of Diophantine equations, which, uh, and the, the larger m and m prime get, the larger the degree of these equations and, and uh, the less we know. And so it, uh, it progress got sort of uh, slowed down after about 99, we sort of ran out of mathematics uh, to, uh, um, to proceed. Um, and then also we know if n and m are very close to each other. Uh, if you have two collisions that are close to each other, we also have, have some results that, that there's no other collisions than, than the ones that we uh, uh, already saw. Okay, so um, we have some results. Um, um, if, if you can't solve a question in mathematics, you try to look for partial results, some sort of uh, weaker statement that you can still say. Um, so one approach to solving this conjecture is uh, instead of asking if there's a bounded number of solutions, uh, so for any t, uh, you want to solve this equation and choose m equals t. Uh, we think there's only eight solutions at most, uh, but maybe we, we can get some other bound. 
Um, and um, so um, there is sort of an, an easy bound that you can get. Um, so uh, as I said, you can work on just on the left half of the triangle. Uh, so in the left half of the triangle, n is at, is m is at most n over 2, or n is at least 2m. So if you want to solve uh, t equals n choose m, n is at least 2m. Uh, 2m choose m, that, that turns out to grow about exponentially in m. Um, so if you flip this equation, um, if you want to, to find a binomial coefficient of size t, the, uh, the, the column that you need uh, has to be of size about log t. Um, and so what this tells you actually is that the total number of solutions to this equation can only grow at most logarithmically in t. It can only be as big as log t, um, which isn't bounded, but it's, it's not too big. Um, so people have tried to improve this log t bound by a little bit, but, they c but only tiny improvements have been made. Um, so as I said, it's very easy to prove the number of, bound the number of solutions is, is about size log t, and then various mathematicians improved it. Uh, log t over log sub 2t is called log of log of t. Um, and then uh, you can get log t times log 3t, which is log, log, log of t. Um, there's a joke that, you know, what, uh, what sound does a drowning uh, number theorist say? It's log, 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 because <laughs> we, we love our logarithms. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we, we can Im improve the bound by a little bit. We can improve, uh, basically, we can, we can get three powers of log, log t. Um, over th over this uh, this basic bound of log t, but but uh, it's still very very far from getting down to uh, to bounded. Okay, um, so um, I worked on this question with many other um, mathematicians uh, earlier this year. Um, actually, we weren't working on this question in initially. We were working on another question in number theory, but then we discovered that the uh, the work we were doing actually had a connection to this conjecture. Um, and so uh, what we found is that. Um, if you work in the left half of the triangle uh, and you take away the, um, uh, if, if you only work somewhere in the interior, you, you don't get too close to the edge. So the, the left half of the triangle is when m is between 1 and n over 2. Uh, but if you make m a little bit bigger, um, and so there's this weird funny thing, exponential of log n to the 2 thirds, but okay. But if, if you, if you um, stay away from the edge, which is the hardest uh, region of the tri triangle to understand, uh, but you work in the middle, um, then actually you only get at most two solutions. So it's like um, okay, leave it over here. Like uh, if if you can somehow if you remove uh, this part of the triangle and you only sort of look in in a region like that, then every number appears at most twice. Like this number might appear twice, but no number appears more than twice. So there is a big region of the triangle where we can prove this conjecture, but uh, the region um, over here, th the region near the edge, um, that is still very difficult, unfortunately. Uh, but we, th so that was what we were able to do this year, um, kind of by accident, actually, because we were, as I said, we were working on a different problem in uh, number theory. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, I realize, like, so that maybe not all, everyone in the audience is a mathematician, so uh, maybe some of the details of the proofs are a little bit technical. Um, but, um, uh, we combine two different um, ways of looking at the numbers. So um, in, in number theory, we, we divide sort of number theory into, into two, two halves, kind of. There's, there's something called Archimedean number theory and non-Archimedean number theory. So um, Archimedes um, wrote, was the first to state what we call the Archimedean principle, uh, which is that if you take any small positive number and you add it to itself over and over again, eventually it gets bigger than any um, fixed target. Uh, this is the Archimedean principle, um, and it's the foundation of much of analysis. Um, and so, so the, uh, the, 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 the real numbers and the natural numbers are what we call an Archimedean number system, because they have this property. Um, but later on, um, number theorists uh, discovered non-Archimedean number systems that don't have uh, this property, that, that you take a small number and you add it to itself, you never, um, it, 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 has a, it stays bounded. It does, it go, in fact, it goes back to zero, or, uh, or it, it doesn't exceed a certain size. Um, so th there, are, um, there are two ways you can view the, na oops, yeah, there are two ways you can view th um, the natural numbers. You, you can place them inside the real numbers, which are Archimedean, and you can use methods of Archimedean analysis, your, um, like calculus or, or complex analysis. Um, or you can um, do non-Archimedean things, like you can count how often n is divisible by a prime or by a square of a prime, and a cube of a prime, 
And uh, this um, involves thinking of the natural numbers as living inside a number, another number, number system called the Piatics, and those are non-Archimedean number systems. Um, and so uh, we use two different approaches to try to control this conjecture, and it's the combination of these two that actually uh, lets us uh, do what we, uh, uh, what we want. Uh, for number theorists, this is a very standard uh, uh, strategy, but uh, it, it may not be so well known outside of number theory. Okay, so um, just to talk a little bit about how uh, the Archimedean approach works. So um, the binomial coefficients n choose m, of course you can write them as factorials, right? So there's n factorial over m factorial, n minus n factorial. Um, but famously the factorial function can be extended. You can, you, you can take the factorial not just of integers, uh, natural numbers, but you can take the factorial of reals. You can talk about half factorial. I think uh, half factorial is like twice the square root of pi. Uh, or um, you can take this, the factorial of, of any number using uh, the gamma function of Euler. Um, and so uh, you, you can generalize this equation from integer solutions to real solutions, um, and, you get, uh, and you get this transcendental equation here. And you can invert it using the inverse function theorem. Uh, and what you find is that if you fix t um, and you fix m, uh, there's exactly one n that solves this, this, this equation. So you can invert this equation and you can write n as a function of m. Uh, and this function is transcendental. It's, it's, um, it, uh, it doesn't have a nice closed form, but it is analytic. Um, and basically, uh, the, the way you can think about this um, equation is that you are taking the graph of this funny function f sub t, and you're looking for lattice points. You're looking for points where m and f t of m are both integers. Um, and that will give you a solution in Pascal's triangle. So you can, you can turn this problem into sort of an, an analytic problem. You have some, some smooth transcendental curve, and you want to ask how many lattice points uh, there are um, uh, on this, on this uh, curve. This is a problem that's very well studied in number theory. In fact, actually, uh, Enrico Bambieri in particular was uh, 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 a, a lot of work in, in this area. Um, I don't know if he was a member of this academy, actually. But, uh, um, all right. So, um, all right, but um, okay, maybe I will, yeah, okay, so um, this, the gamma function, we understand very well, there's lots of asymptotics, and we, we know roughly what this function looks like. Uh, so this function ft is, is transcendental, but you can do asymptotic and approximations, and it turns out that, that it has a fairly um, good approximation. It's, it's roughly t times n factorial to 1 over m. So it's, it's fairly well, um, uh, controlled, and we also understand its derivatives. So the, uh, uh, the, s the order of ft of m you can compute is about m times the m theta t. Uh, you can compute how big the derivative is, and you can compute how big the second derivative is. Um, but w uh, when you do this, one thing you discover is that this function, actually, the second derivative is always positive. Um, so this function that we are, this curve that we are trying to find lattice points on is, is actually convex. Um, and you can also control higher derivatives too, but, uh, but let's just focus on the second derivative. Um, but um, being convex is great because um, once you're convex, it's very hard to have too many lattice points on a convex curve. Um, it's a pity I don't have a can't draw here. Um, but um, you see, um, if you have a convex curve and you have three lattice points that are close to each other on a convex curve, then the triangle that they uh, generate will have a very small area uh, if the curve is, is growing very, very sl a small but positive area. Um, but the um, okay, so um, okay, so on the one hand, if a curve is very is smooth and convex, the uh, three nearby points will have a generate a triangle of small area. But on the other hand, there's a classical theorem from geometry called Pick's theorem that if you take any three lattice points with integer coefficients and you look at the triangle, the area of any triangle is, has to have area at least one half. Okay, for example, the, the unit triangle one by one that's area one half. But um, on, on a lattice, triangles have to, um, have to have area at least one half. Um, but on the other hand, on a smooth curve, triangles uh, on the smooth curve have to have a, have a very small area if they're close together. Um, and if you put these two facts together, what they tell you is that you cannot have um, three lattice points on a smooth curve that are very close together, because the area will, area will both be bigger than one half and less than one half, and you get a contradiction. So because of this, sort of, um, this geometric observation, um, um, once you get, uh, yeah, so if, uh, if you look at a very small interval, if you look at lattice points in a short range, you can only have at most two solutions. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you actually uh, do the calculations more carefully, uh, well, yeah, what you find is that, um, 
Yeah, so if you have one solution to this equation, and you choose n equals t, and if you have another solution which is close enough, which is close to n choose m, so that the distance is less than, than a certain um, uh, range, then um, you have at most two solutions in that range. You, you cannot have three solutions uh, in, in that small interval. So this is what the Archimedean approach tells you, that, that if you can localize all your solutions to a short interval, then the number of solutions that are remaining in the interval is at most two. So uh, that's the Archimedean half of the argument. And the non-Archimedean half of the argument is devoted to making sure that all the solutions stay close to each other. Um, OK, so, so this is the, uh, the Archimedean um, side of things. Um, all right, and so uh, we were able to use um, some facts about prime numbers, and that was what we were actually working on before we started working on, on, this, on, this, on this problem. Um, and we were able to, to show that whenever you have two solutions to this, um, to this equation, n choose m equals t and n prime to n prime equals t, and you're on the left half of the triangle, then any two solutions must be fairly close to each other. There, there was a certain upper bound on how close uh, these solutions had to be to each other. And if you combine that with the Archimedean analysis that we, we, uh, we just gave, that will eventually give us a main theorem after a certain amount of calculation. So, um, all right, so we want to show that, that, any, that collisions only occur when two numbers are close. Or in other words, if you, are, if you take two points that are very far away from each other in Pascal's triangle, they should, the binomial coefficients should not be equal. All right, so um, how does, um, how do we do that? Yeah, so we no, longer, we, we no longer use the real numbers. We don't use the gamma function. Uh, so we instead use these non-Archimedean concepts like uh, divisibility, like how often a prime divides a number. Um, so um, yeah, so we now look at the prime factorization of the binomial coefficient. So um, n choose m, we can also write as the product of, of n cons m consecutive numbers uh, over m factorial, which is 1 times 2 times up to m. Um, and uh, once you have this, uh, this factorization, you, you start seeing, this tells you a lot about the prime factors of, of this number. So for instance, um, if, if, a, if p is a prime that's bigger than n, any prime bigger than n will not divide this binomial coefficient because it doesn't divide anything in the numerator. Um, on the other hand, any prime between n and n minus m plus 1, uh, so any prime between n min and n minus m plus 1, that will divide this binomial coefficient because uh, if there's a prime in here, it's going to show up once in the numerator and no times in the denominator. So, um, so um, this binomial coefficient is, is divisible by every prime in this interval between n minus m plus, plus 1 and n, and no prime after that. Um, so one thing this tells you is that uh, if this interval contains a prime, so if this interval is big enough to contain a prime, then um, the, the biggest prime in this interval is also the biggest prime that divides t, because any number bigger than n will not divide t, and any prime in this interval does divide t. So, um, so the biggest prime, prime divisor of t has to lie in this interval. Um, so if you have two different solutions with the same t, um, and these two, if these two intervals both contain the same prime, so they have to be pretty close to each other, and this would make uh, n and m. Um, the two solutions have, would have to be close to each other as well. Um, but that's only if you, have, uh, if you can find primes in short intervals. Okay? That, that if, if that this analysis only uh, is, tells you something if this interval is actually you know to contain a prime. Um, but unfortunately, uh, our understanding of primes in short intervals is somewhat limited. Um, uh, for example, the, uh, the best result we know about primes in short intervals is that uh, if you have an interval of size about x to the point five two five. From uh, of, um, uh, around x, uh, we know that any interval of this type contains a prime, but uh, no shorter interval we know to contain a prime. Um, so if you just use this uh, basic fact, you you get a very weak estimate, um, not good enough to to prove um, our theorem. Uh, you can do better if you assume things like the Riemann hypothesis. Ha, huh, okay, this uh, this Riemann's name. Okay, um, but um, um, or a conjecture of, of Cremer. But uh, but unconditionally, we don't have um, um, very good estimates. Um, but we, we can um, refine the analysis that we, um, we did before. So um, going back to this sort of um, factorization, so I, I told you that, th that this binomial coefficient is divisible by all the primes between n and n minus m. But also, uh, you, there, there are other things you can say about 
this prime factorization. Like if you take a prime which is just a little bit bigger than m, uh, so between m and say 1.1 m, um, then we can say that um, such a prime is very likely it will will almost um, will almost always divide this um, uh, this binomial coefficient. Uh, the reason is, is that if you have a prime which is a bit bigger than m, then it's not going to divide anything in the denominator. But it's very likely to divide something in the numerator, because um, there are m consecutive numbers, and if p is just a bit bigger than m, it's very likely that one of these m consecutive numbers will be a multiple p, because uh, you're covering almost all the residue classes mod p. You're very likely to contain zero. Um, so statistically, most of the primes in this interval um, should um, should divide this this binomial coefficient. But um, uh, by the same token, if you take a prime just a little bit less than m, say between 0.99 m and m. Um, then, um, okay, I'm cheating a little bit, but, but you would expect that very few primes in this interval will divide um, this um, binomial coefficient because um, if a prime is just a little bit less than m, then it will appear once in the, in the denominator and it will probably appear just once in the numerator because the number of consecutive um, classes here is just a little bit bigger than p. Um, it might appear twice in the um, in the numerator, so so it, it can be divisible by, by by a prime in here, but not very often. Um, so basically, uh, m this number m becomes a transition point. Um, that if you look at the primes that divide this this binomial coefficient, statistically you expect a lot of primes bigger than m to divide this coefficient, and then it will drop, and then suddenly very few primes um, divide. So there's this statistical threshold. Um, which you can use to try to figure out uh, what m should be. So, so once you know, if, if, you, if you're given the value of n choose m, you can look at the primes, uh, and there'll be this spike. And you can try to use this spike to figure out what m is. And so if you have two different solutions to this equation, um, maybe there are not so many spikes. Okay, and so, so the two solutions should actually be very close to each other. Um, and so this is a more promising approach, because uh, this interval actually is, um, so, so here the width of the interval is about the same size as, as the, uh, the numbers in the interval. Um, these intervals we do know contain lots of primes. Uh, one of the most basic theorems in um, number theory is the prime number theorem, um, which actually Riemann also studied here. In fact, the most famous uh, uh, in, in number theory, like half of analytic number theory, is, is founded from this, this one paper of, of Riemann uh, on the number of primes less up to a given magnitude, um, where he introduces the Riemann zeta function. And, extremely influential. Just eight pages, okay, and it's sort of, it's half of analytic number theory is based on this paper. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah, so, so uh, these intervals we understand pretty well as far as primes are concerned. And so we have this, uh, so we just need to, so uh, we just need to do some sort of statistical analysis and make rigorous what, what I just said, um, that, uh, that somehow the, that there's some, a change of behavior in the prime factorization of n choose m as your primes um, transition near m. Okay. And in fact, there, there are similar transitions. Uh, so, so m is one place where there's a transition. There's also transitions at, at 2m and 3m. So uh, if you actually plot the primes that, that divide this, you, you see all kinds of nice, nice patterns. I should have actually put some numerics in, in this uh, slides. I, I, unfortunately, I didn't. Um, OK, so uh, all right, some more details. Uh, OK, so now the formulas are going to get a little bit more messy. I apologize for those who are not mathematicians in the audience. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, uh, th th um, yeah, so the way you actually make this rigorous is that, um, so there's the classical formula of, of the genre of, um, if you ask how many times does a prime divide n factorial, uh, uh, that's called nu sub p of n factorial, and there's a certain formula. Uh, you divide n sub n by p, you take the integer part, you divide n by p squared, you take the integer part, and you sum those, and uh, that infinite series will give you the number of times p divides n factorial. Um, and the factorials um, are involved in the binomial coefficients, so uh, this formula implies, as a consequence, a formula for um, the number of times p divides a binomial coefficient, which is called Kummer's theorem. Um, and it turns out to be, to be this. So, so um, you take the fractional part of m divided by p over j, and n minus m divided by p over j, and subtract the fractional part of, of n um, over p over j. And you sum all these numbers, um, and this gives you um, this number here. Uh, one way to think about this is that you write m as a number base p, and you write n as a number base p, and you add them, and you count how many times um, you have to carry a 1 when you, when you add, and that number of times is actually the number of times p divides n choose m. It's called Kummer's theorem. Um, Kummer is known for many more famous theorems. This is a very easy theorem of his, but uh, anyway. 
it's still called Kummer's theorem. Um, so um, one consequence of this is that if you have uh, two numbers that uh, uh, that collide, two binomial coefficients that collide, then um, then for every prime p, um, this sum here, which is the number of times p divides this binomial coefficient, must equal this sum here, uh, the number of times p divides this binomial coefficient. So so this equation is actually uh, you can sort of factor it into an infinite system of equations. For every prime p, uh, you have to have this uh, this identity. Um, so if you can show that these two, uh, these two um, expressions have different statistics, like, like if, uh, if, this num if this number is uh, equal to 1, say, 10% of the time in a certain interval, and this, this, this is equal to 1, 20% of the time in that same interval for primes in a certain interval, then you know that th th um, these two guys cannot be equal for every prime, and that tells you that, that th this collision does not occur. So we just need to understand the statistical distribution of, uh, these, of these sums here. Um, all right, uh, maybe I'll skip this slide of, uh, yeah, I'm just going to give some special examples of, of uh, this formula. But um, yeah, so, the, um, so now we connect. So um, the reason why we started working on this, on this problem was that we were actually looking, studying um, the distribution of, of um, uh, so these sort of, of quantities, dividing m by a prime, dividing by m by a prime squared, and so forth, we were actually studying. Um, so um, one thing we uh, um, we realized uh, working on this on a separate project was that, um, for example, if you take a prime randomly in a certain range, like you pick a prime between, say, capital P and capital 2P, you pick a random prime, and then you, you pick a uh, large number n, and you look at the fractional part, n divided by P, uh, and you um, and you take the fractional part of that. So that's, that's the number between 0 and 1. Um, it turns out, so if, if, if n is too small, uh, if n is less than P, you get a very small number here. You get a number very close to 0. But if n is big, if n is bigger than p, like say size p squared or something, if you take a big number and you divide by p and you look at all the fractional parts, then it turns out that the f these fractional parts are very evenly distributed. They're what's called equidistributed on this interval. Um, so um, the behavior of this fractional part changes depending on whether n is bigger than p or less than p. And so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a transition that you can quantify. And there are similar stories for, for n choose p to the j. Um, and then there's a more complicated things about correlations. If you have a pair, n choose p and another fractional part, n prime choose p, um, sometimes they're independent. Uh, these fractional parts have no relationship to each other. Uh, sometimes they are very closely related. For example, if n prime is twice as big as n, then there's a very um, close relationship between, between these fractional parts. Um, so uh, we were studying um, sort of the, the distribution of these fractional parts for another application. Uh, and then we realized that knowing that, that these sort of um, distributions would actually help us answer this other question. Um, the reason why we can answer these questions is that um, the questions of equidistribution, uh, it's, it's well known um, in the subject that you can answer them using the methods of Fourier anal analysis. Um, and basically what you need to do is you need to understand uh, what are called exponential sums. Uh, you take things like uh, n over p um, and you raise them, so um, uh, the, the notation e of something means e to 2 pi i times, times whatever's inside here. So you might sum e to 2 pi i n over p for all p in an interval, all primes p in an interval. And there are various ways to control these sums, and this is what we were studying. Um, it turns out eventually we can use uh, some very classical estimates of Vinogradov, actually, because you have some very good bounds, uh, the type of bounds we need um, for, the, for this problem, um, as long as n and m are not too big. So th there's, there's a, uh, the Vinogradov bounds let you control this sum as long as n and m are bigger, than, uh, bounded by a certain weird function of p, and this weird, f this weird expression is why we have a certain weird expression in our final theorem. Um, but anyway, we, we use these Vinogradov estimates to get these exponential sum estimates, uh, to get uh, these uh, equidistribution estimates. Um, and because of that, we can actually make um, the previous statements that I, I said rigorous. Like if, if you look, if you take p, if you draw p at random just for a, um, a little bit less than m, for example, you can show that, that this type of sum is almost always zero. It's almost never one. Um, whereas if you pick a number at random which is a bit bigger than m, then this, this type of sum is, 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 is this expression is almost always one rather than zero. Um, and so uh, we can control the distribution of, of basically every single expression in, um, on both sides of, of this equation. Um, there are some more complicated things. We also have to control uh, covariances, uh, how much each term correlates with the others. And that's, that's a bit more complicated and a bit more combinatorial. 
but uh, with these basic tools, uh, now it's just a matter of doing a lot of calculation. Um, and uh, I think we were able to, uh, um, um, to show that, that if M and N are very different from M prime and N prime, then somewhere there will be a, um, a range of P where, where, where this sum is very different, has very different statistics in this sum. And that's how we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, um, show that there's no collisions for coefficients that are too far apart, which means that the, coefficients, the collisions can only occur very nearby, and then we can use this Archimedean analysis based on convexity to, uh, to proceed. Um, but maybe I will skip the details of that. Um, yeah, it it's, uh, becomes sort of geometry of numbers and combinatorics at that point. Um, okay, I think uh, maybe I will not sk I will skip the details and just uh, uh, and just end there. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>